All living organisms are intimately connected to the energy waves of the universe. Our Creator designed a symphonic relationship between these organisms, light, and the energy fields of nature. We are encompassed by this symphony of harmony. Welcome back to Session 3, Creation in Symphony. In the last session, we talked about days one and two of creation in the creation model. In the first session, we learned that evolution just won't work. In fact, Wolfgang Smith, Ph.D., physicist and mathematician, recently wrote in a globally respected journal, a growing number of respectable scientists are defecting from the evolutionist camp. Moreover, for the most part, these experts have abandoned Darwinism not on the basis of religious faith or biblical persuasions, but on strictly scientific grounds. There is a basis lacking for evolutionary plausibility. There is a basis that is solidly entrenched in scientific research supporting the creation model. Yesterday, or in the last session, we talked about a firmamental canopy above the globe created on day number two. This is called the Rakia in the original Hebrew language. I brought to the session today a photograph taken recently and I believe displayed in Discover magazine which shows that today there is a buildup of ice particles 50 miles above the globe. These ice particles are consistent in large sheet layers and what this really shows is that in certain areas of the magnetic field there can be a natural occurrence of sheets and layers of ice that can be radiating the glow of planetary structures and the glow of the sun. Now you'll remember I spoke in the last session about the fact that we're losing the strength of the geomagnetic field. Physicists have found that when a field is strengthened it pinches or has a radius that is much tighter. Well, in the current situation where we do not have a recharged context with the cosmic energy lacking in recharging the magnetic field because we are lacking the firmamental canopy above that field, we do not have the recharge mechanism, so these lines of force have loosened or broadened out. Today they extend 40,000 miles out into space. However, during a period of solar flares or sunspots, that additional cosmic energy causes these lines to concentrate. What this shows is cosmic energy does share a recharging of the Earth's magnetic field if there is a mechanism to keep it in place. And 50 miles above the Earth, there is at least a limber, low moment, low energy field or line of flux sufficient to hold some of these ice particles in place. Now I spoke also in the last session about the fact that there is a design in the universe suitable for man. Let's dwell on that from the academic standpoint. During recent years physicists have been preoccupied with a concept that is extremely interesting. And the concept is this, the universe is so spaced and so designed from the proton, the electron, the nucleus, the energy of the atom, the individual atoms themselves, the effect of star bodies including our solar system with its planets and sun, the effect of all of the marshaled unit of the universe, all designed for some reason with man in mind. It's called the anthropic principle. Evolutionists are adrift today on how to explain how all of this could have happened. In fact, the best explanation they have is we live in a very fortunate window of the evolution of the universe where the uh, separation, cosmic separation of star bodies and star clusters and the shells of star clusters are just right. Space is sufficiently large. The solar system has evolved to an intricate point 
with refinement to the degree of 10 to the 55th power in precision so that currently in this very fortunate window man can evolve and survive. Well, that's very interesting. It's very convenient to say it's fortunate at this moment. A far more plausible explanation, a far more academic explanation, is to realize that the entire universe was created for the benefit of the man that is looking at this video at this moment. You were in mind in the Creator's design. Let me express this from various scholars. Physicist Reason Carr in Nature magazine, a very highly respected scientific journal globally published, wrote an article called The Anthropic Principle and the Structure of the Physical Universe. Now, anthropos has to do with man. That's the Greek for man. The anthropic principle and the very structure of the universe. Class, what I'm really trying to say is this universe, from the microcosm to the macrocosm, from the very tiny to the extremely enlarged, has all been designed with you in mind. Now here's what these physicists found. They calculated the mass of the cosmos from the atom to the entire universe, and they found that the size of planet Earth is a geometric mean, an average, a unit, a geometric mean of the size of the entire universe. Let me say that again. They found that the size, mass, and volume of the Earth is a direct geometric mean to the size of the universe. So planet Earth figures into this prominently. They also found that the mass of the human body is a geometric mean of the mass of the proton and the planet itself. So this means that it's not the cats and the canaries as delightful as they are. It's not the reeds and the palms and the ferns as delightful as they are. But the entire universe and planet Earth and man have an infrastructure of design. Also the reeds and the ferns and the insects and the birds all figure into this design, but for the benefit of man. They found that these proportions further relate to the electromagnetic and gravitational constants. They're not simply physical particles themselves exclusively. Well, it looks like this universe was designed for man. And that is the principle of creation in symphony, the composite creation model. In the last session, I talked about the fact that on day number two, the creator said, let there be a firmament. And he designed above the earth this very thin, transparent for the most means, for the most part, transparent, fiber optic, superconductive canopy above the earth. That canopy would have kept the atmospheric gases in place, and those atmospheric gases were provided on day number three. We do not have that canopy today, and we are the worse off for not having that canopy today. In fact, one of our consultants, Dale Peterson, MD, uh, wrote a very fine scholastic research project called Longevity and the Biblical Record. And he said, excess-free radicals attach themselves to cell membranes. Now, let's go back a step. In the last session, we learned that as the ultraviolet radiation penetrates through the atmosphere down to surface Earth, it excites the oxygen molecules and other molecules as well, but primarily oxygen is a, a very uh, radical agent when charged by ultraviolet radiation. It excites that, free radicalizes the oxygen molecule and others so that we ingest those and we're being contaminated. In fact, Dr. Peterson, who is on faculty, adjunct faculty, University of Oklahoma School of Medicine, former faculty member at Wisconsin School of Medicine, uh, has written, excess free radicals generated by this lack of the canopy attach themselves to cell membranes LDL cholesterol, and even DNA. They penetrate right inside the cell membrane. Damage done to the human body is enormous. The list of conditions felt to be caused by or aggravated by free radicals includes arteriosclerosis, Alzheimer's, cancer, high blood pressure, schizophrenia, Parkinson's disease, Down syndrome, strokes, cataracts, arthritis, 
emphysema, dandruff, wrinkles, memory loss, mental sluggishness, over 60 disease states are felt by a number of researchers to be caused by or aggravated by these free radicals. Now, prior to the flood, when we lost that canopy, those free radicals would not be generated because the ultraviolet radiation would be trapped along with other shortwave radiation, thus energizing the geomagnetic field and not penetrating for the detriment of man. This session will have to do with day three and day four of creation in an orchestrated design or creation in symphony. A friend of mine, Paul Taylor, has written a splendid book, Illustrated Origin Answers, and he has listed 102 academic processes showing the earth to be very young. I would recommend that you get that particular book by Paul Taylor. We're talking about days of creation and a recent creation. John Morris, very fine friend of the museum and of creation research worldwide, published a book recently called The Young Earth. I recommend you get The Young Earth by John Morris. In The Young Earth, this very fine scholar asked the question, how long is a day? The Hebrew word yom is the word translated day from the Old Testament. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. The light he called day and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. How long was that day? Dr. Morris points out that there are various ways that the word day can be used. As a solar day, essentially a 24-hour day. Daylight, just one half of a day. Or indefinite periods of time. And he states appropriately that this word yom occurs 2,291 times in the Old Testament, and it almost always means a literal day. When used in the plural form yomim, 845 times, it always refers to a literal day. When modified by a numerical or an ordinal in historical narrative, 359 times in the Old Testament, of, uh, like Genesis 1, it always means a literal day. And each time it was modified. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And the evening and the morning were the second day. And on the seventh day, God rested. When modified by evening and morning, 38 times outside of Genesis 1, it always means a literal day. So it certainly would mean the same in Genesis 1. It forms a basis for our work week of six literal days, Exodus chapter 20. Now, proper interpretation is a solar day, not indefinite periods of time. On day number three of creation, God said, let the dry land appear, and the dry land appeared. That dry land involves the entire infrastructure, involves the core of the earth, involves the surface structure. The water was already there. And it involves particularly the granite. I spoke to you in session number one about the granite. According to the evolutionary model, this granite worldwide, which today averages between 8 and 16 miles in thickness, depending on whether it's been crumpled into mountain formations or is simply underlying the basic uh, strata of the earth, this granite, according to evolutionary hypothesis, took 300 million years to crystallize. But according to the biblical record on day number three, God said, let the dry land appear, and the dry land appeared. Is that plausible? Dr. Robert Gentry, to whom I referred in the first session, did some marvelous work in which he showed that the inclusions, the little pleochroic halos, the tiny little rings of energy circling the nucleus of a body or circling the area where a body of radioactive material has transmuted to another element. Dr. Gentry found the rings left by polonium-218, polonium-210, 
and polonium-214. The half-life of polonium-210 is 22 days. Now, remember that after seven half-lives, all of that particular radioactive material is gone. So the least the day, uh, at the outside, the day would have to be just a few weeks, even if it were outside the literal day. But it cannot work outside a literal day. Not only did Dr. Gentry find the pleochroic halos of polonium-210, but he found the halos left by polonium-218. The half-life of polonium-218 is less than three minutes. In 20 minutes, all of the polonium-218 in a body of polonium-218 would be gone. So in a matter of minutes, that crust had to be formed. The granite had to be intact and functioning and recording. But it's better still. Dr. Gentry found that polonium-214, whose half-life is 0 0.000164 seconds, 164 milliseconds after seven half-lives had elapsed, you certainly could not have even snapped your finger. Faster than we can snap a finger, all of the polonium-214 would be gone. That means that it had to be crystallized, functional, and recording in a very brief period of time. That has to be a literal day. Now, not only is the surface structure a design, but the internal structure was designed with moderating elements that are radioactive. Uh, remember that water is heated up by radioactivity. Remember that 40 feet of water will stop even uh, very powerful radiation in the gamma range level. The structure is that inside the earth there are moderating elements that give off a gentle heat. Watch this closely. The purpose of radioactive materials is to generate heat. I live a few miles from the Comanche Peak nuclear reactor. The purpose of that reactor is to simply, with the right amount of fusionable, uh, fissionable material, with the right amount of that fissionable material, to uh, put it close enough together so that it'll heat up the water, to generate steam, to drive the turbines, to generate electricity. Very simple and forthright. Radioactive material is designed to give off heat. Watch closely. Before the flood of Noah's day, this firmamental canopy was in place from day two all the way to the first day of the flood. It filtered out shortwave radiation. It filtered out some of the infrared radiation, which means that we would only have a gentle temperature buildup during the light of day. Now, plants, botanists tell us, do so much better if you generate pink light for them. We have scientific data showing that. Remember that the color of that was a gentle pink, magenta. That triggers the growth and reproductive cells of plants. In addition to that, plants do better if the roots are heated two or three degrees above the ambient temperature. Everything is designed for the optimal genetic function of all living systems, the earth and the entire universe. So we have a structure built inside the earth which will gently radiate nuclear reaction, which will gently heat up the waters, which will gently warm the roots of the plants. How large did those plants get? Well, I'll have to give you an illustration. Let me build the context. Here we have an envelope in place, keeping the atmospheric pressure in place. Later, I'll refer to stats showing that Neil Teague, one of our very fine consultants, given the indication that geophysicists know the Earth has expanded, has refined the diameter of the Earth. It was approximately 10% less. It has expanded at the time of Noah's flood and Peleg, which we will study later in these sessions. Don't miss a single session. Given a 90% diameter of the Earth before the flood, given the additional gravitational attraction, given the compression of this bubble of water with very thin metallic hydrogen suspended inside this crystalline structure, altogether that would compress the atmosphere to 28 
pounds per square inch. Our refined consideration is today 14.7 pounds per square inch at sea level, but we added essentially another atmosphere pressure due to the conditions I've just described, which means we had hyperbaric atmospheric pressure twice our current atmospheric pressure. Also, geologists have found in the structure of the limestones a greater amount of carbon dioxide, essentially eight times our current amount. We currently have 0.026% carbon dioxide. We, at that time, would have had just about 0.25% carbon dioxide. Greater atmospheric pressure, filtration of the ultraviolet, uh, generation of pink light, and gentle heating of the plant. What will this do? In the fossil record, everything is bigger. Everything is larger. We're talking about day number three. We first had the structure of the earth, and then we had the plants created on day number three. Now, these plants were created completely functional. Remember on day number one, this sphere of water was com completely created functional as a sphere of water. On day number two, the crystalline firmament was functional. On day number three, the infrastructure of the earth, internal and surface, were totally functional. Remember, it was functional faster than we can snap our fingers. Also, the plant life created on day number three was totally functional. With immediate youth, but functional maturity. Class, remember that expression. Immediate youth and functional maturity. Let me prove it to you that the biblical record, which is the manual of scientific creation, uh, the biblical record shows clearly that this was the case. The creator on day number three created the plants, or the vines, the fruit was on the vine, and the seed was in the fruit. That meant that the moment they were created, they were functionally mature, yet young, healthful, ready to be devoured, or ready to be harvested. Ready to reproduce, or ready to be harvested. How big do those plants get? Today we have a plant called the Lycopsid club moss. The tallest we can grow it is about 16, maybe 18 inches. But in the fossil record, that very same plant got up to 120 feet tall. How do we explain that? The evolutionary scenario does not even attempt to explain it, but the creation model, particularly this creation model, creation and symphony, can explain it. Not long ago, an outstanding scientist at Keio University, Tokyo, Japan, Dr. Ki Mori, planted a single tomato plant. Now, he planted this tomato plant in his basement of all places. He had his office in the basement, and the Japanese are very fond of having all the physical world expressed in miniature. He planted a nice little cherry tomato plant. You're aware of the fact that the cherry tomato plant gets bush high. Uh, the mature tomato is the size of a cherry, maybe the size of a quarter. And he planted his um, tomato plant in his basement. It was growing fairly well, but he needed more light. He didn't want to bring in more electricity, so he had a brilliant idea. Out at the university, he had some fiber optic cable. He brought it home, ran it out the roof of his house, through his attic, and the rafters, down the walls to his basement, and directed it toward his plant. Now, it worked beautifully. It picked up the rays of the sun, transferred them down, shown them directly on his plant. Now, what Dr. Morey forgot was fiber optic cable filters out ultraviolet radiation like water filters out ultraviolet radiation and like that firmament above the earth would have filtered out ultraviolet radiation as long as it was in place until the time of Noah's flood. So the light he was getting on his tomato plant was essentially like the light we had before Noah's flood. Let's see what happened to his tomato plant. It started to grow extremely well. He knew he had something. In fact, it grew so well he had to take it out of his basement. He took it over to his lab, built a special platform, 
built a canopy filtering out ultraviolet radiation. But he knew the plant wanted more carbon dioxide and nutrients than it could get normally. So, brilliant scholar. He used a pliable gasket at the top of the stalk, one at the bottom, designed a cylinder, added atmospheric pressure to get the stalk to accept more carbon dioxide and more nutrients. Wonderful. It would have been better had the entire plant been encapsulated in greater atmospheric pressure, but that's very expensive to do. So, essentially, he was simulating the creation model to a great degree. Before the flood, we had the greater atmospheric pressure, the greater concentration of carbon dioxide, filtration of ultraviolet, etc. Now, his plant grew wild. Let's see what happened to it. Here is a photo of his plant after two years. His tomato plant is a tree. 16 feet tall with 903 tomatoes on it. And those cherry tomatoes are not cherry tomato size. They are baseball size. But that's not the end of the story. That's after two years. His plant is now about 14 years old. It is still being maintained. He had to take it inside a huge hotel. It is now approximately 40 feet tall, has approximately 15,000 baseball-sized cherry tomatoes on it. What I'm trying to say is, if we simulate the conditions before Noah's flood, we get a wonderful result and we produce specimens that are approximately the size of specimens caught in the worldwide flood laid down in the fossil record. So the fossil record does not illustrate millions of years of evolutionary progression. The fossil record represents layer upon layer of sedimentary deposit that occurred just a few hours apart in a global flood. The creation model works. I think we've seen that there's design in this entire area of creation. But let's just see how designed it is. I brought to studio a sketch. I've mentioned again and again in this series of lectures that all of the creation is infrastructured. The cell, every component of the cell is interdependent and codependent. We're now learning that the entire universe is orchestrated for the benefit of man. And if the proton, scholars have found that if the proton did not have its specific charge, then the hemoglobin with an iron atom with a number of other atoms surrounding it, the hemoglobin would not have the right charge to pick up the oxygen to transfer it to the body if the spin of the proton, the mass of the proton, and the behavior of the proton were not precise, you couldn't get blood to live. That means the universe has to be at a perfectly orchestrated balance. Wow, that's interrelationship. But now, upon Earth, there's an interrelationship. I've emphasized that the days of creation have to be solar days, have to be literal days, essentially 24 our days. Let me show you how this is verified in creation. On day number three, we had the plants created. One of those plants is a particular variety of fig. But that particular fig cannot be procreated without a fig wasp that is designed especially for its benefit. Now remember, we're just on day number three during this creation. It is not until days five and six that the insects are created. So if those days were long periods of time, this particular variety of fig would see its demise long before its procreating wasp arrived. Let me show you how infrastructure this really is. Inside the fig, there are closed flowers out of which a male wasp emerges. He was laid in there and hatched in there. Immediately, instantly, in the darkness, he is designed to do the following. 
He searches for the female wasps who have not yet emerged. He fertilizes them, then he does one other thing. He digs a hole, drills a hole, eats a hole from the inside of the fig to the surface shell of the fig, then he retreats and dies. His job's over. Hours later, the female wasp proceeds. She hatches, arrives. Now, she immediately goes through the hole dug by her brother, the male counterpart. She goes to another fig, just like it. She enters and starts searching for the flowers. Now, before she exits the first one, being feminine, she has to inspect the whole house. So, this female wasp, just hatched, checks all the flowers. And as she checks them, the pollen gets all over her. Then she exits the hole, the channel, dug by or eaten by her brother. She then proceeds, goes inside the next fig by a special channel that is one way only. She then inspects two kinds of flowers. One is the male that has antlers. She, of course, has pollen from the first fig. She, from that first fig, then pollinates the male flowers. Then she goes to the female flower, which does not have the antlers. She deposits eggs, and then she dies. The cycle is over. And the only way this fig can be pollinated is by that particular wasp. In other words, the creation of day number three could not have continued had these been long periods of time before that particular wasp was created. The evolutionists have a very difficult time explaining that principle. It's called a symbiotic relationship. One depends on the other. Each of these life forms depend on the other. So day number three of creation was orchestrated. That brings us to day number four. On day number four, the stellar heavens were created. Remember a principle that has been clearly rendered in this series. All of the creation was immediately young, no scars, no mutations. Everything with optimal genetic expression. Immediate youth, but functional maturity. On day number one of creation, we find the light expressed from the Creator Himself. That light flooded the entire universe. Now think about that for a moment. If light flooded the entire universe, leading evolutionary scholars have published that light did flood the entire universe. If a Big Bang occurred, it had to occur with the following statistics. In 10 to the minus 30th, of a second, that small unit of light and energy had to expand 10 to the 50th power of dimensions. I asked one of NASA's very fine engineers to put that in his computer. He came back to me a few hours later and he said, now you want me to take a very small bit of energy, 10 to the minus 30th of a, uh, of a second expanding, and its dimension is infinite, the size of a pinhead, and in the time expressed of 10 to the minus 30th of a second, you want me to expand that 10 to the 50th dimensions. Correct. That's what the evolutionary astrophysicists have suggested would be plausible. He came back a few hours later and he said, that is infinite velocity that would flood the universe completely with light. Well, now, we're not saying it began with that explosion. That is not our thesis at all. We're saying the Creator stated, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light that it was good, and that light flooded the entire universe. Physicists have admitted that in light is the necessary energy for the functioning and later transmutation of all the physical elements in the star bodies. 
So these two models parallel. It's just that the time is entirely different. And it is that, according to the evolutionary model, time, chance, and natural circumstances become the hero of the plot, when in the creation model, it is a purposefully divined, orchestrated creation committed by an intelligent, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient creator God. So, on day number one of creation, the universe was flooded with light. If in all the other areas of the creation you have immediate youth and functional maturity, then it's certainly plausible that on day number four, when God coalesced the stellar bodies into place, the blazing suns and whirling galaxies, he did that with immediate youth and functional maturity. I've had individuals say, now wait a minute, how are you going to get the energy back to planet Earth? Watch closely. How big is the universe? I don't know. It's as big as the Creator wants it to be. There are a lot of postulates, but no one knows for sure except the Creator Himself. No matter how big it is, it's no problem in the creation model. You see, I type. I go dot, dot, dot. I push a carriage. It comes back. The typewriter carriage comes back. I go dot, 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 push a carriage. It comes back. Now we work with a computer. We work on a screen. We push a button. That computer printer goes zip, 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 zip. There are computer printers that can start from the bottom and print from the top simultaneously. I was lecturing on this in Oklahoma City. One of our consultants, Dr. Dale Peterson, came up and he said, you're right, but it's better than that. He said, I have a new computer. I type what I want. I can uh, schematically design a universe on the screen. I push the button and the printer goes splat and prints it all simultaneously. Now, don't you think God's a little smarter than we are? If we're at the point where in our universal expression, we can instantly get all of the data aligned logically, systematically, intelligently, where it all benefits the design we're asking for. If we can do that with our creativity, it's simply a, a orders of magnitude for the Creator who is in charge of all of it to do the very same thing. Stellar bodies are in place systematically. Let me give you some data that I think would be interesting. A number of scholars have wrestled with the problem. Do we have a geocentric universe or a heliocentric solar system? Well, let's see. Geocentric means that the sun would revolve around the earth and the stars would revolve around the earth. Heliocentric, of course, would mean that in the solar system you have the earth revolving around the sun and then the sun going through his uh, circuits of the entire universe, which is true. Sir Frederick Hoyle, one of the world's leading academicians, has stated recently, geocentricity is the Copernican theory or the Ptolemaic theory Correct. Copernician theory is heliocentricity. Ptolemaic theory is geocentricity, which is correct. Dr. Hoyle stated, and he is certainly not a creationist in our sense of the word, he began as an atheist and certainly as an evolutionist, but has found that the data does not support that position. Dr. Hoyle said the relation of the two pictures, geocentricity or heliocentricity, is reduced to a mere coordinate transformation. And it is the main tenet of the Einstein theory that any two ways of looking at the world which are related to each other by a coordinate, coordinate transformation are entirely equivalent from a physical point of view. So from the physical point of view you can refer either way. So when the Bible refers to the sun rising and setting, not only is that an earth-centered concept, but that's an Einsteinian concept as well. Some vast bodies have been found out in the universe. Let's take a look at a very special display. I want to talk to you about some academic research before we look at this in some detail. Margaret Geller and John Hutcha of Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics found a great wall out in the universe. 
500 million light years across, 300 million light years high, and 15 million light years thick. Johns Hopkins University, uh, in conjunction with the University of Illinois, found superclusters that I'll illustrate in just a moment, appearing at regular intervals 400 million light years apart. Seven separate clumps to the north and seven separate clumps of superclusters to the south in the galactic or in the universal sense. Now, did you get that? I've been illustrating the creation and symphony model. I've been trying to emphasize the fact that it's all designed. They're now in a major quandary, trying to understand how all of this could have been structured by evolutionary processes, when instead it appears to be structured independent of those processes and by a specific design. In the 1600s, a star in the constellation of Cygnus became bright. It's called P. Cygni. It was half again as bright in the 1700s as it is today. What this means is astrophysicists are finding that that star is aging too fast. And that means that its entire history can be calculated in hundreds of years, not in thousands or hundreds of thousands of years. There's an infrastructure that is very young. In trapezium in the Orion Nebula, four stars are moving apart from a common point at high speed. Out in the constellations, in one particular area in the Orion Nebula, that's part of the Milky Way galaxy that you'll see in a moment illustrated, four stars are moving apart from a common point at high speed. At that speed, that common point would have converged just 10,000 years ago. I'm trying to say Everything is orchestrated. A leading scholar recently published in Scientific American, previously it seemed scientifically unsound to have light created before the sun. The present scientific view does indeed assume the early universe to be filled with various kinds of radiation. He said that's consistent with a biblical statement, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now, let's illustrate this particular chart. Our point is that not only is the creation orchestrated, designed, but it is orchestrated and designed by a creator. There's only one plausible creator whose work matches that of the rest of the data. And that is the creator of the Bible expressed in the person of Jesus Christ. Let's see if the constellatory bodies have anything to do with consistency with what he claimed to be. First of all, there's Polaris, the North Star. That's used for direction. The creator of the Bible and the creator in this model have an invitation for us to follow that creator in purposeful meaning to life. To show, the, to show and locate the North Star, we have a system called the Big Dipper. And one of the stars from the outer bowl points directly to the North Star. This is a cluster of seven stars, and a central star gives it its very meaning. It's called Mizar, and it has to do with the sheepfold. We call this Ursa Major. However, it actually is not a bear with a long tail. No one saw a bear with a long tail. The very meaning of the stars themselves in the composite indicates a sheepfold with special care by the shepherd. And then the handle points to Arcturus, which is a primary star in the constellation of Bootes, the shepherd. So we have a design indicated here. Leadership, guidance, a fold, and a shepherd to do the designing. That shepherd is not simply sufficient for our needs, but in the constellation of Leo, he is seen as the lion of the tribe of Judah, totally consistent with his own power to create the universe. He is also seen in Gemini as dual nature, the God-man, and he certainly manifests himself as the God-man. 
In this universe, he is also expressed in Virgo, holding the scepter. And here we've envisioned that creator with the scepter in his hands and his lap. We have had, already illustrated previously, the beautiful design of star clusters. We've abbreviated these into seven from the great wall in the center with four on each side, or three on each side, but there actually are seven to the north and seven to the south, spaced 400 million light years apart, design which evolutionary hypothesis cannot understand. Let's illustrate that again. Finally, a glorious array to this central display of the Creator's handiwork is further outlined of himself, and finally, the Milky Way as a tremendous canopy of joy, emphasis, and glory to the Creator himself. There is further design in this creation which will require additional information for us to present. Let me conclude this particular lecture by pointing to the solar system itself. The solar system is composed of, of course, the Sun, Mercury, Mars, Earth. We have the interior planets, the Sun, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Earth. And then with Mars as the starting point here, we have, of course, Jupiter, some asteroids. We have Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Kepler felt that the vibratory cycle in the elliptical union of these planets with the sun would indeed give off a musical note. Not only are these spaced intricately, for influences, for biological influences, that is not to say that your life is determined by astrology. By no means we condemn that position. But the Bible clearly indicates that everything was orchestrated for the benefit of man. Kepler was right. It has recently been found that the idea of celestial notes has a valid basis, since musical notes are always produced by repeated regular vibrations whether originating from vibrating strings, reeds, or drum membranes. As the planets circle the sun, the motion of each one is unique in its form in a slow, regular vibration. Don de Young, splendid researcher. And of course, all of the masses, charges, and other properties of the subatomic particles, according to Science Magazine, arise from vibrations at different frequencies a uniform chorus of violins playing a symphony of different notes. Now, wait a moment. Science Magazine article recently admitted that the entire universe is producing a symphony. Kepler did excellent work to show that particular notes from B and G and C sharp and E flat and F and E flat and additionally, C, G, E, F sharp, etc., all were inherently involved in the constellary or orbital operation of the planets. Now we find the universe bringing symphony to us. Sky and Telescope magazine stated, as if by a chain, our planet's surface is connected intimately with the space environment. And then Uranus and Neptune, according to a special publication in a secular journal, have great pressures of extreme heat so that all the carbon atoms have been compressed into diamonds. Let's take this a little further. With these very large planets having a diamond infrastructure, with a vibratory cycle, it has been found in some of NASA's research that there are literal tones emanating from some of these planets that they've been able to analyze. Robert Whitelow wrote of Harmony in the Heavens. He's a very fine scholar at Virginia Polytechnic. Robert Whitelow indicated that these planetary alignments and their masses and this, the area they sweep out 
not only sweep the very same amount of space in proportion to their velocity, but they're all related to various instruments, at least mathematically. It is stated that Pythagoras had reported that he could hear the celestial sounds. None of his disciples could, however. Now, the notes played, current, secular, astrophysicists admit that because of the vibratory cycle and because of the spherical alignment around the sun in the rotations, these particular notes would be played and some of them indicate actual melody. Shakespeare wrote, look now in Merchant of Venice, how the floor of heaven is thick inlaid with patines of bright gold. There's not the smallest orb which thou beholdest, but in his motion like an angel sings. Such harmony is in immortal souls. But whilst this muddy vesture of clay doth grossly close it in, we cannot hear it, or can we? Work has been done to show in 21st century science and technology that there is a relationship, a conical relationship, with this musical scale in orbits of the planets and the biological systems. They have published data to show that the antenna of the DNA actually picks up vibratory cycles. They've illustrated this as the DNA is tuned or energized by these vibratory cycles. Let's take it one step further. In the book of Job, chapter 38, verse 7, the Creator said to the patriarch Job, Were you there when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Some of our researchers have found cause to believe that the firmament in its crystalline capacity matched precisely the ingredients of a crystal radio receiver with a crystal, an antenna, water makes a very good antenna, and you will find the crystalline metallic hydrogen intercomposition to complement that. A crystal, an antenna, an energy field, and the Bible does specifically state that it's the morning stars that sang. What we're finding is all of the stars sing to us, all of the planets sing to us, all of the energy of radiation in its vibratory cycle sings to us. But we're learning that if it's the morning stars singing, there is a real plausibility factor indicating that that canopy could actually pick up and audibilize that music so that individuals could hear it. In fact, a physicist whose name is Torelli, a lady, recently received her PhD doing research on the radio signals coming from pulsars. And she stated in a science journal recently that we actually are being hugged by this cosmic radio energy. And she actually took the digitalized information that's there, transferred it, and produced a tape audibilized it and it actually is a soothing healthful hugging of cosmic radiation one missionary from Alaska wrote that within the last few years near the top of the globe near the area where the concentrated lines of energy are stronger in moment and energy that you some of the missionaries and Eskimos actually report notes, audible notes, being heard because of the ice crystals in the charged lines of energy. I highly suspect that before the flood, each morning when the rays of energy were just right, when the energy level was appropriate, we could pick up some of the soothing background music that the stars particularly the pulsars are giving off with a background harmonious solar system 
actually blending in so that we could feel and sometime hear the music of the spheres. There's much more to come. Don't miss the next section. <laughs>